Welcome to the Unconventional Dyad Podcast, where psychology and psychoanalysis meet social justice, feminism, politics, climate change, critical theory, graduate student mental health, and the arts. Your hosts are Carly and Laura, two graduate students and friends committed to bridging the gap between the field of psychology, social issues, and society. Thank you for joining us. Fun. So thank you so much for joining us. We are both really thrilled to get a chance to talk with you today. Absolutely. I'm glad to be here and, and, and talking with you lovely ladies. This will, this, will be a, this will be fantastic. Where do you even want to start? Anywhere, because that's, that's where I start when I, when I wake up in the morning. Anywhere and yeah. everywhere. So to get us started then, tell us a little bit about who you are. Who, who is Alfonso? I am a, a nomad. I am everybody and nobody. Um, I'm based out of Cleveland, Ohio. Um, I am not an analyst. I'm not a, an academic scholar. I'm not um, an expert. I'm not a professional um, in any scientific or scholastic field. I am an everyday subject, just like everybody else, just trying to make it through this world um, as sanely as possible uh, amid um, all of the chaos that is uh, subjectivity. Mm-hmm. So that is, that's basically my life in an essence, <laughs> in a nutshell. Mm-hmm. You occupy so many different spaces. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about the spaces that you occupy and how you imagine them working together and maybe um, playing off of one another. Uh, So I guess growing up, I was very big into the arts, uh, specifically uh, drawing, drawing and, um, and music. So, I drew quite a bit. I remember in my second grade, uh, I was in an art class and we had to do a, a drawing uh, exercise of, of plants and foliage. And I guess my teacher enjoyed what I did so much. She took me to the side after class and started showing me like a bunch of uh, Picasso and, and all that sort of stuff. And I didn't really understand at the time because that's not where my head was. My head was in things like comic books because comic books was where my imagination really allowed itself to, to take off. So, um, you know, I, people tend to have a sort of, uh, you know, childish sort of attitude towards comic books because uh, compared to con- more conventional literature, uh, it doesn't seem to offer offer much, you know, because it's either just, you know, superheroes or or content that superficially doesn't sound very appealing in relation to the greater world. Um, but I would vehemently uh, push back against that because uh, what comics can do for uh, a child at that age is allow for the boundaries of imagination to go anywhere it wants and, and needs to go. Um, so when I'm sitting down and, and reading a comic book, it wasn't just you know what was on the page, it was the images in between what could, uh, what could be um, present, but also what was impossible. So it's not like, so if there's a guy flying, you know, in between the panels, I can imagine what he might be doing, but also I'm there as well. So it's the possibility of me flying is also missing from that page, but in my own imagination. So in general, that's what comics sort of did for me um, growing up. So it really wasn't until, it really wasn't until college where I started to get more into uh, the fine arts and really understand what that world uh, was. 
Um, as far as music, music was sort of, music was interesting. My father always had a, a very eclectic uh, music collection. Uh, so, you know, you would find anything from uh, Michael Jackson to blues stuff to uh, jazz to um, just jams that, that he did, um, you know, all sorts of stuff. And that was particularly formidable for me and important um, because without, a, without that exposure, at least from his side of things, um, I think I would have maybe come out a little bit differently on the creative end. So it's not that he sat down and just sort of told me what these things were. He just had it there and then I was allowed to just explore on my own. So he was never, you know, dictatorial about uh, those kinds of things. Um, so I grew up principally with my my mother, um, and she she had she had an interesting collection as well. Um, her tastes were also sort of eclectic. So um, she liked a, a lot of choral choral mm -hmm. music. Um, you know, R and B and, and jazz. Um, so there were a number of things that I got from her end as well. So between the both of them, um, I had a nice solid foundation of, of musical exposure. Um, and then my aunt, um, her older sister, um, was very heavily into uh, classical because she's a singer uh, by, by uh, vocation. So there was that end as well. So I had like the whole mix going. I had the whole mix going from from a young age. So um, as I got older, I exposed myself and got exposed to, you know, a greater variety of influences. Uh, you know, even going as far uh, north in, in Norwegian as, as black metal. So, wow. um, you know, all the metal heads you know, out there uh, know what I'm talking about. But mm -hmm. so, yeah, very international. What really struck me when you were talking about that was this idea that, you know, when we listen to music, some people might think of that as a very passive activity. Mm -hmm. But as a child, I, I don't really see it that way. As we are listening to music, I feel as though it's a very active process, despite us maybe not being conscious to what it is that we're hearing. But mm -hmm. it, it, is, it is a very active um, process. And I'm kind of wondering how you imagine those, that very eclectic, um, group of music, how, how that really influenced you and, and how that really impacted you as a child? Um, for me, I think growing up, I never put boundaries around cultural boundaries around these things or, or any of the things that I was interested in. You know, that was, you know, as you get older, I think people's imaginations start to get more constricted as they are more impressed by the, the responsibilities and, and weight of the world that they have to deal with um, every day, you know, going to work and everything that is within that sphere of, um, of encountering. Um, but I mean, we're, we're basically microphones that are on all the time. So not just on, but on in front of the speaker that we're listening to. So there's that constant feedback feedback loop, you know, going. It's not noise though, it's um, sort of existential dread in a sort of way. But I mean, people should always understand that, you know, even while the child is in the womb and, and this is all, you know, scientifically um, backed and understood you know, as the child is developing in the womb and they're gaining their senses, they're already experiencing the world. So even before they are present to you outside of the birth canal, um, they're getting information from, from mom's uh, body and, and putting that together in the, in the way that they know how at that particular time. So, um, so when it comes to, you know, just being out in the world and, you know, hearing something and, and, and picking things up and seeing what other people are listening to, um, you know, it, it was just second nature. 
So when I hear um, something that sounds good or something that I liked, you know, I would go investigate. Um, and that's essentially how, you know, I came to um, enjoy all the things that I do, you know, um, you know, from, from listening to classical to, to, to R and B to, to metal to, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, but I will say, I will also say that in terms of myself, I do tend to, I do have certain musical proclivities, I guess you could say. There are certain musical elements that I'm drawn to for the reason I don't necessarily know to myself, but I know that I enjoy those things. Um, for example, uh, for those who know what a major seventh chord is, um, the sound of a root position major seventh chord is absolutely glorious to me. Doesn't matter what key it, you know it's in or or what um, what register it's in. That chord just strikes me, and I can pick it out anywhere, you know, in in a musical setting. Um, why that's the case, I don't know. I know that it's always been the case. Um, so there's other, you know, examples like that, but that's just one example of um, how I'm drawn to music in, in certain kinds of ways. Very cool. You also are very interested in fine arts, and I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about your interests and maybe where are they stemmed from? It sounds like you've kind of always had an interest in, in the fine arts, but it seems like you really took it somewhere in, in college. And I'm curious if you can speak a little bit to that. Yeah, I would say uh, I, was, I was heavily involved in the fine arts from, from my youth through college. And then it stopped sort of cold turkey around 2014. 2014 was the year um, where I sort of put that on the back burner and really got deep into philosophy and psychoanalysis. Mm -hmm. um, the reason was because I didn't feel like I had anything to say arts-wise um, in, that, in that entire realm. Um, musically, I sort of hit an impasse. So my main instrument was guitar. Um, but I was uh, trying to make a transition from um, from sort of you know metal and, and rock based playing towards um, like R and B, gospel, and, and jazz guitar. Um, there are a lot of musicians, a lot of great musicians here in Cleveland. Um, but I think for those particular genres, the guitar player um, is not often um, a featured role. So the keys player, you know, and the drummer and the bass player sort of take the lead. If you do have a guitar player in the mix, it's usually set, set back um, and not as prominent. And also, you know, they're not usually in, a, in any, given, any given ensemble, you're not going to just find one. You'll find all three of the other instruments that I just mentioned much, uh, much more before you find a guitar player. So, uh, and trying to find that, you know, that Tutledge, I wasn't able to, to do it. So I said, all right, let me put that on the back burner and let me change directions and do something that I wasn't able to um, do sort of up until this point. So I just changed my course of, course of action and went to the bookstore up the way, half price books, um oh you you guys have those uh where oh, you guys yeah. are we sure do <laughs> yeah man they are all over the midwest all over um so i started going there checked out their philosophy section uh piece by piece i ended up with a collection of 2000 some odd books some of which you can see behind me um currently the majority of them are actually packed up um the reason for that is because during covid um, my situation got a little bit unstable. I had to leave my previous job and in the interim, I wasn't sure what was going to, you know, happen if I was going to have to move or not. And there was no way that I was going to be able to put 2000 books in storage and pay for that. 
So um, ended up boxing him up. Um, eventually they will make their way uh, to half price. <laughs> <'Cause they'll be laughs> the ones to, uh, you know, that can take an amount like that. Um, some of them I will save probably about maybe a, a good couple hundred, but, um, but yeah, but apart from all that, um, um, I forgot the original question. I'm sorry. Me too. I, I think <laughs> we, we have arrived. <laughs> we are so, um, yeah, we're just so enraptured with everything you're saying. Um, I actually, I have a comment to make though. As you're talking, the word that keeps coming up for me, and it's a word you mentioned in the beginning is nomad. And you described yourself as a nomad um, at the beginning of the podcast, which is so interesting to me um, for multiple reasons. Number one, I've, I actually described myself as a nomad as well. And I've never heard anyone else use that term when they're asked about themselves. So it's really cool to hear that. Um, and I, I use that myself because I've moved around a lot um, as a child. So I moved from country to country. I never really felt like I, you know, had a country of origin. Um, mm. But what really strikes me is that the way you seem to dabble in all these different things that you get really engrossed in, that that reminds me of a nomad, kind of like a traveler, you know, going from philosophy, to psychoanalysis, to music, to fine arts. Um, and I wonder if that's part of the reason you use that word, or if there are other things that kind of went into your usage of that word. Sure. No, I mean, absolutely. It's a, I mean, it was an unconscious decision. So I would say creatively, I mean, the way the energy flows through me as it flows through, I would say probably many others, um, you know, it leads you, I don't lead it. So I would even say, you know, in 2014, when I made that switch, it wasn't even necessarily a, a conscious decision. Mm -hmm. It was just sort of an instinctual decision. Um, so, you know, even with the stuff that you, you know that you might see me write on social media and, and all that, you know, none of it is pre-thought. Mm -hmm. Most of the time I'm actually in motion when I'm writing it. So on an average day, I mean, I'm up by nine o'clock and both of my jobs uh, now, they're both second shift, which means I get home late. But also um, every day, I always try to guarantee two hours to myself, you know, to have, to do whatever. Most of that is usually just, uh, uh, just sitting and, and trying to read and, you know, get through um, uh, scholastic obligations that I might have or, or anything else. A lot of, a lot of the time just reading. Mm -hmm. I think that's important because if you don't set time, um, for yourself every day, then you're allowing, you know, your environment to sort of swallow you whole. And, and I, uh, refuse to do that. So, uh, I've been doing that actually since 2010, mm -hmm. since 2010. So, um, but yeah, so most days I'm gone out of the house for at least 12 hours. So if I'm waking up early and getting home late, I have to have some time to, to do something. Mm -hmm. So, um, when you're, when you're put in that sort of, sort of circumstance, you really have to choose wisely what it is that you're going to do. So being nomadic in terms of what, in terms of the scope of the things that I want to accomplish um, and do within that given time um, is almost like a non-choice. Mm -hmm. I have to, in order for me to get through the volume of stuff that I need to get through, I have to bounce around. If I don't do that, then I'm I'm going to get stuck, and I'm not going to be able to keep up with myself. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it's really playing a game against playing chicken with contingency. You know, um, contingency is always going to lead the situation, but I still have a little bit of control over the rudder. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, setting aside time for yourself is important, and with the time that you do set for yourself, um, 
you have to do whatever's necessary to 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 get the things you want done. So yeah, nomadic being nomadic is important, and I think a uh, Felix Guattari would probably agree. So for those who don't know who he is, um, if folks are familiar with Gilles Deleuze, the uh, um, famous uh, philosopher, he was his compatriot in action uh, on the uh, philosophical slash uh, psychoanalytic scene. So. I'm really curious if you can speak to the idea of creativity, how you mm -hmm. imagine creativity, how your um, nomadic lifestyle might contribute or might hinder that creativity. Um, yeah, I mean, it's like I'm like I was saying before. It's not something I necessarily control. It it controls me, and I'm just the medium. So. Um, you know, we can throw a, a, a slight reference in there to Marshall McLuhan, uh, the great uh, um, Canadian media ecologist. Um, yeah, creativity is creativity is not something that's just limited to the fine arts, mm -hmm. which is the domain that most people probably associate it with. It is very active in the scientific domain. Um, it's very active in the humanities. It's very active in, um, you know, everything from social work to architecture, you know, construction, you know, practical construction. Um, every endeavor that you will find subjectivity, you will find creation because you have to, creation involves, um, creation and creativity involves intuition, some degree of intuition. Um, and some degree of imagination and intentionality. So when you take those factors and you in inscribe that into the word expression, um, expression is not just personal expression. You know, if we wanted to, you know, involve, you know, some of the ideas of Graham Harmon's object-oriented ontology, you know, you start to see expression as inhabiting not just anthrop anthropological human subjects, but other non-human phenomena that are active in the existential sphere that we live in. Mm -hmm. So if it's here and if it's present as a phenomenon, then it is doing something insofar as it is intentional or perhaps unintentional, unconscious, unconscious in what it's doing, that still constitutes an expression. So that's where you start to broaden the horizon of what aesthetics in general means. So um, thinking about expression and creativity and aesthetics in that more holistic um, worldview just beyond uh, the human subject, um, it really starts to become a more uh, diverse and heterogeneous picture than than most people probably probably think about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's it definitely important. Again, it's important to concede to to take that into consideration um, because even when you think about spheres like politics, you know, which is a, which for me is just a, it's an endless sphere of circulation of signification. You know, you have all of these, it's like when people think of fashion, people think of, you know, things changing on a dime, you know, what's the new thing? Mm -hmm. um, Politics is in a, in a very similar way. It takes on the same kind of structure because a lot of what's happening um, between the constituency uh, and the managers slash politicians slash leaders is a lot of valuation passing back and forth. The constituents want the leaders to do certain things. They're doing certain things, not necessarily what the constituents want, but at the same time, the leaders sort of encapsulate 
an impossible position. So they are sort of caught between this um, perhaps Lacanian uh, split between like need, demand, and desire. So insofar as the manager is supposed to uh, inhabit that space, being the, the signifier of, uh, um, the, the master signifier of all of these things that a lot of different people want, um, and them knowing that they can't fulfill all that, it creates a certain type of uh, anxiety and a rupture. And uh, in a certain sense is, is, is part of the problem of the political sphere and why things can't be accomplished in the first place. That's not the only reason. There's a multitude of other contributing factors. Um, but that dynamic is, is definitely an important one um, that I think a lot of people don't necessarily uh, take into account when they're listening to the news, when they're, when they're actually even um, sufficiently engaged in their local politics, which contributes to um, what, the, what the, the politician can do, you know, because local politics is important. Um, of course, the flip side to that is not everybody can, um, has the time and the time investment to be involved in local politics. Everybody's doing different things. You know, some people go to school and work at night. Um, some people are, at, you know, pulling twelve-hour shifts. Um, and then some people just, you know, don't have the the the, the media that, or the technology to even keep up with what's going. So it, there's a lot of different people, a lot of different people, in a lot of different spaces doing a lot of different things. So the sort of flattened demand for everybody to um, be involved, um, you know, even at a minimal level is still difficult to achieve. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's, it's complicated. Yeah, I, I have so many questions about that. I guess, it, can we go back just for a second about this idea of creativity? And, and then we can certainly go into politics since I'm also really curious about that too. Mm -hmm. What I was thinking about is, is creativity and how that relates to productivity. Mm -hmm. And you were talking previously on a previous episode about this idea of productivity. I'm wondering if you can speak to the process that happens when you, when you produce something, when your creativity turns into some type of product and if that hinders mm -hmm. your ability to be creative or perhaps it, it, it might not do anything at all. I'm, I'm curious what you think about that. Um, I think for me, I've made the conscious decision to not monetize, you know, anything that I do, and I wouldn't necessarily go into a monetizing situation. You know, I know that's a very big thing right now, especially during COVID times where people are looking for alternative means of, of income um, due to their primary means having lapsed. Um, so I would say for me, it's not really it's not really an issue. Um, you know, when it comes, it comes. So right now, most of my ex creative expression is just, is through writing. I'm trying to actually find my way back into the arts. Um, I haven't uh, been totally successful at that yet, but I'm still, still working at it. Um, but for now, it's principally writing. And, you know, again, like, I don't control when it strikes, something bubbles. I try to be ready to write it down. I write it down and then sort of that's it. Um, it ends up either you know on a social media platform um, and then you know I move on to the next to the next thing. But um, I would say the actually the more difficult part is archiving. Um, Currently, I mean, I have like, since I started in 2014, like really marking and, and writing all this stuff down, most of it is, is just plastered on like my, <laughs> my Facebook wall. So initially, like I was, I first started like just writing stuff out by hand because I really liked the process of taking the time to put it on the physical page. At that time, that was, that was important to me. 
Um, but as time went on, you know, things, thoughts started moving faster and I also didn't have the physical time to write things down. Again, part of that was just being in motion, you know, wherever I was. Um, so eventually I just sort of had to, you know, keep a pad in my back pocket with a pen. And then that just sort of evolved with, you know, just making more and more notes on my phone. Mm-hmm. And it's sort of just spiraled into this thing. You know, I'm just, I just have to be ready all the time. So I'm mm-hmm. always making more notes on my phone and I'm just, whenever it comes, I'm just plastering it on my, on my wall. I had like, I had a whole lot of, of, <laughs> of Google docs uh, that I had to sort of throw into a folder because there was, there was that too. Um, yeah, currently it's, it's a mess. It's a mess. Most of it's on my wall, but physically and like all the, the other, the back end archiving is, it's all over the place. So mm-hmm. um, yeah, most people probably don't, don't think about that, you know, because we have so many devices that can record things. But, you know, if it's physical media, then you don't have to worry so much about immediate corruption. But if it's digital media, then you absolutely have to think about that because if you're not thinking about where it's going to live, um, you know, you still have to um, have a reserve. You have to back it up. So if it's not hosted somewhere online, then you have to have a hard drive to, to keep that backup. And then you have to have a, a backup to the backup and then a backup to the backup to the backup. And it never ends because, um, you know, again, digital media is very ephemeral. So, so archiving all of this stuff is the most difficult part. Um, creatively expressing it is the easy part. So, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, um, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Um, I'm just thinking, like I know we said, we're kind of come back to this politics piece and I'm, I'm wondering, and this isn't a well-formulated thought yet, but I'm wondering how these ideas of creativity and creative flow and productivity might play into some of the problems that we're seeing in the political sphere. Um, mm-hmm. Like I'm almost wondering if you feel like there's a sense that that creative flow isn't quite there in the, in the political sphere or if there's too much focus on productivity or if you see any other sort of interplay between those two things in that arena. I'm, I think a lot of people, you know, with the current capitalist environment that people usually uh, ascribe to the environment, I think people sort of link productivity, endless productivity to the capitalist environment. Um, I understand that, but I don't necessarily feel that I personally am compelled to produce. I produce the way I produce because I want to see myself grow in a certain kind of way. Um, So it's less about my environment impressing on me than it is more about um, me wanting to see things come ex nihilo from nothing. I enjoy seeing something that wasn't present now become present, whether that's in the form of thought or some sort of creative artifact um, or a relationship or um, whatever the case may be. Uh, For somebody who has that sort of um, uh, artistic sort of uh, perspective. There's a certain, I don't even know how to describe it, but there's a certain magic that comes with seeing that process through because it affects you in a certain way. So usually when people think of artists, they think about what they've done, the work that they've done. But from the audience perspective from those observing the artist in their process, they won't get to experience what it is the artist is Mm -hmm. experiencing as they create that. And for me, that's the more important part 
the experience and what happens to you, how you're transformed through the creative process. Mm -hmm. um, it's not exclusive to the artist. Anybody can do, anybody can do that. They're, everybody is always working on some creative level apart from, from art making, you know, the, you know, just from, you know, getting up in the morning and maneuvering the way they do throughout the day, successfully or, or unsuccessfully. It still takes, um, it still takes a, a degree of um, intuition and imagination to make, uh, to make that happen. Mm -hmm. So, um, but in terms of, in terms of, of politics, um, it's complicated because as I was saying before, the political sphere is a complicated sphere because there's, there's a lot of need, demand and desire going on that inherently can't be fulfilled mm -hmm. due to the nature of both how we are as you know, ontologically as subjects but also what it means to be involved in a group of any size. So what happens in my perspective, um, when you have increasingly large groups is that you have what I would call, you know, a, a coefficient of subjectivity. So all phenomena, whether it be an event, uh, an object or whatever, has a certain degree of autonomy and agency we as human beings happen to have a particular kind of autonomy and agency that allows us to mediate things that other things can't mediate. Mm -hmm. So while the sun can, you know, be a, a star encapsulating this giant mass of chemical reactions that produces heat for its an immediate environment, which happens to allow us to stay alive, we can't do that. But what we can do is have a thought in our head, write that down on a piece of paper, mm -hmm. and then turn that into a book, which then becomes um, an artifact that makes its way through history. Um, so keeping that in mind, um, as creative subjects, we, We have, we can do a lot of different things, but we still have to work within the limitations that, that we are as finite human subjects. So, so there are certain things that are more easily achieved through smaller groups because there's less conflict between all of those differing um, locuses of autonomy and agency. When you start getting into you know, larger groups like uh, cities, states, nations, um, continents, things like that. Um, you have to find a way to organize that. And humans have a very particular way of knowing how to organize themselves when groups get larger. The flip side to that is of course, it's efficient but it's not necessarily the best way of going about it because sometimes that way encounters its own limits, which then forces a reaction from those constituents who don't necessarily know how to get around that. So there's always, you know, impasses and, and through ways and transversal uh, vectors that are crisscrossing every which way. Then you also have different indeterminacies that are happening as well. You know, certain subjective black holes that sort of happen. You know, fixations people get get uh, trapped in because that's the only way that they know how to um, maneuver in that space. So, when you factor in all of the heterogeneous elements of the world, you know, even subjects alone, every person is different. Um, your subjectivity ends where somebody else, somebody else's begins. So 
even as a dyad, you know, how do you manage that? I mean, you could think about a relationship, two people just, you know, trying to get along, trying to make, trying to make it work for the duration. You know, that's hard enough in itself. When you turn that into three, into four, into 4,000, 4 million, um, there's no rule book. There's no manual that um, tells you how to do that. You have to figure it out in the moment, um, you know, as you go along. Now, again, fortunately for us, we have histories and we can record our thoughts and um, make notes and keep track of things and come up with efficiencies and, and ways of keeping track of the ways that things work and don't work. But um, again, there's always limits. So part of what we're always doing in the political sphere and beyond is trying to figure out how to transgress those limits, but also set limits at the same time, because you know it's that weird relationship between determinacy and indeterminacy. You know, there's some, they're very co-determinant, but there's no there's no simple hard line between the two. So there's what um, what I would call transmorbid, I guess you could say. So there's comorbidity, which is familiar um, in the in the sciences, which means you know two um, two diagnoses inhabiting the the same the same space within the, within the subject. Um, but I would define transmorbid as a sort of sliding, ambiguous sliding between various various domains and spaces to where you can't really tell um, which space is which mm. or where the cause within a particular space is. So when I think of determinacy and indeterminacy um, and how they work together, there's definitely um, a lot of transmorbidity going on. And that's essentially the political sphere in the in a nutshell. Not just that, but, oh, excuse me, any social sphere where you have a lot of people engaging either in the same thing or, or a lot of different things. So, um, yeah, when you, when you factor that, when you factor that into things, like into the daily, even the most mundane things um, about life, it gets, it gets very hairy and, and overwhelming, you know, because you can't, you can't conceive all of that. You know, part of being a subject is being limited in such a way that you cannot conceive all of the 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 experience and and, and territory and being that even you encapsulate. Mm -hmm. There's no way you would have to, even if you lived forever, there would mm -hmm. still be no way to do that, because the paradox of that is is that as you go on you're still encountering new situations. So it's like, it's that weird phenomenon of like, you know, being a crystal and, you know, crystal's edge is constantly at the forefront of, of how it's developing. So if you're constantly there, then, you know, where's the in and in, in the out, where do things begin and end and that sort of thing. So very hairy. I can't help but think about psychoanalysis when you're talking about that. Mm -hmm. um, not only were we just talking about, you used the word um, transmorbid, um, mm -hmm. but we were also talking about creative expression too. And I, when you were talking about that, I, I couldn't stop thinking about psychoanalysis and how psychoanalysis kind of encapsulates what you were just talking about. Yeah. Um, you know, as everybody knows, there's a lot of different disciplines out there, a lot of different um, social sciences that work on subjectivity. Psychoanalysis um, is special in the way that it is because it focuses on a um, particular um, phenomenon called the unconscious. Um, so stemming from Freud onwards, uh, I think there's, there's a, a lot of, and a whole wealth of information within the domain of psychoanalysis that is not um, explicitly focused on or even uh, acknowledged by some of the other 
um, social sciences and, and, and psychological um, areas, part of that, you know, again, is, is ego. Um, the other part, no I pun intended. Is, right. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Good catch. Um, but the other part is, you know, especially with the sciences, the sciences are always sort of playing this hegemonic game of trying to edge out the other guy. So because part of that process involves, you know, financial, financial resources and, um, you know, and bodies to facilitate the study, you start to, you start to add a lot of noise in the sound mix. So when political games enter that, enter that picture of somebody trying to get their research funded uh, so that they can do what they want to do, you know, all of that comes in and just sort of ruins the party, you know? Um, and it's, it's a shame, but again, that goes back to, you know, what we were talking about before. Um, when you have a lot of these, when the group gets bigger, you know, uh, things get more, a little bit more dirty um, and sometimes dirty to the point where, you know, the, the mud keeps you from, keeps everyone from doing what it is they, they want and need to do. Um, so um, I forgot the original question again. Yeah, just, just really how psychoanalysis um, utilizes gotcha. creativity, how it utilizes creative expression, and really talking about, well, can we ever really truly find ourselves? Mm. Gotcha. Even if we live forever, is it ever possible to truly find ourselves and know who we are? Um, I think Lacan would probably definitely uh, <laughs> give a definite no. Um, before we would probably back that up. Um, no, I mean, subjectivity mm -hmm. is, a, is a certain type of phenomenon that, you know, it keeps, for me, it's like the encapsulation of, of the perfect contradiction. You know, it, it's, a, it's a juncture for so many different things that should and shouldn't work at the same time, but it does. Um, sometimes to self-destructive ends, but it keeps on going. You know, um, and I think, so for me, there's, when I think of subjectivity, there's three things that I think about. I think of contingency, I think of foreclosure, and I think of mediation. For me, those are like three critical, I would even call them laws of subjectivity. Um, the subject is always fighting against what they don't know. Um, there are always things that they don't know, things that are foreclosed to their knowledge um, and even to their being um, because of uh, one of those things is scale, physical scale. You know, there's, there's a, a YouTube video that I watched that compared uh, different stars um, within like different galaxies. And oh my God, there's, there's planets that are ginormous <laughs> that, that eclipse our galaxy to you know less than a pin drop so i mean even just thinking about that because it's not something that we that we can consciously acknowledge because we don't we don't see it it's not with our within our um our existential domain immediate existential domain so it's like how do you conceive the effects of what that might do on you on an everyday, you know, basis. Um, so there's foreclosure and then there's also um, mediation. Um, there's always things working with other things, working with other things to make things happen. There's a, an entire network of um, residual redundancies and, um, uh, workflows that allow an environment to function the way that it does. So right now we're using language to communicate, to make certain things happen. We're also using 
technology, which is mediating um, other phenomena like electrons and and certain um, uh, electronic effects to make other things happen. So mediation is always going on. Um, now, in addition to these, there's also um, the idea of individuation. Um, now, there's there's a French philosopher by the name of Gilbert Simondon who talks a lot about individuation. Um, so shout out to Taylor Atkins, um, the Guattario bro from the Machine and Conscious Happy Hour. Um, uh, he's translated um, a, a lot of his work. So he has two volumes that just came out. I forgot the, the publication and I'm forgetting the title uh, at the same time. So we can drop a link um, in the episode afterwards too, so people can get to that. Um, but I haven't actually read a lot of his work because you know some of it is untranslated and also it's it can be a little bit difficult to get to for someone in my particular situation. Mm -hmm. um, so I have my own ideas about individuation with some of the things that come to me, um, which may transversely overlap with some of the things he you know he may say. Um, but individuation from I guess what some people would call the essence of ontology into the way that ontology in itself expresses itself through different kinds of phenomena, one of which is us human beings. Um, when you think about that entire process and all of the steps that have to happen to, to make us and make other things, um, again, you start to see your, your own limits um, within you know, contingency, foreclosure, and mediation. So individuation is another uh, important process of that. Um, and I think it's also important to factor in that in our limitation, um, there are also um, even the biological processes that work through us um, have an ontological basis. So while we're working at the level of the human being, there are still you know, many systems, internal systems that work together to constitute us. Um, not just systems that we've grouped, but um, workings at the cellular level um, that have their own ontology and when we when we think about creativity they are also working at a creative level so ontology is using organic um, biological and, and bio, biogenetic and epigenetic factors to um, allow for certain um, coalescences of expression to allow us to be constituted as we are and we have to also admit that because we are only conscious at a very particular specific level of being, we can't fully acknowledge what those processes are doing at the level that they are. You know, I can't like minimize myself and my, go inside one of my own cells to see what it, you know, what it's doing. I mean, we can, we do that sort of retroactively after the fact through scientific investigation. Um, but we still don't have access to, um, again, create things from nothing. Um, we don't have this sort of godly access. Um, we're always sort of catching up to ourselves, catching up to what's happening to us. So, um, so when we think about uh, when we think about subjectivity, we have to. It's hard to keep all that in mind because you know, again, there's 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 only so much um, information we can retain at any at any given time. So, um, yeah, yeah. I don't even know if I answered the question, but we can <laughs> we can this, circle around again. No, this is great. I I have so many questions for you, Alfonso. I do know that we are running a little bit 
short on time. I'm wondering if I could ask you maybe one more um, and yes. then you can certainly, okay. I'm wondering, you know, the pandemic has been really challenging in a lot of different ways. I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about where you'd like to go next. Um, you know, the pandemic, I think for me, it was quite an event. I, my, my subjectivity, I don't know if we want to call it that necessarily for this particular episode, but I certainly have changed an incredible amount through the pandemic. And I feel like I have certainly changed um, trajectories and what I would like to do in the future. I'm wondering if you've experienced the same and what you maybe hope to do in the future. Oh, ab absolutely. Uh, my trajectory has entirely changed. Uh, most of my uh, work history has been in libraries ever since, uh, mm. you know, beginning my undergrad in 2000, 2002. Um, that has since ended as of mid-September. So um, COVID affected my workplace, which um, caused them to have to assess certain things. In that assessment, um, I decided to make a transition so now I am currently trying to work my way into um, a field that is not anything related to uh, uh, library, library and uh, information science uh, related. So currently right now um, I work in a hospital and I am trying to see if I can further that experience to, um, uh, to make it more, more permanent. Um, so yeah, there's there's definitely been a a, a, a transition for me into a, a space that I'm very unfamiliar with, but very much enjoy. Um, I very much to be enjoy being in a in a hospital environment, um, seeing all of the the complicated workings that happen, you know, behind the scene, um, you know, especially with with COVID and, and how people are dealing with COVID, how the health workers are dealing with COVID. Um, but even apart from that, what it, what it means to sort of operate with that kind of information in, in a very, very contingent environment. So, um, you know, I, I think, I think sometimes people have the tendency to to sort of not, uh, how do I say this? They, they take lightly the amount of knowledge that a health care worker knows in relation to their field and what it is that they have to do on a daily basis. Uh, medicine is sometimes described as an imperfect science. For me, what that means is the knowledge that they know encapsulates very specific um, sets of data that are very consistent. So they, again, we're talking about principally the body. Mm -hmm. So insofar as ontology itself is consistent in producing subjects like us, we are able to take that knowledge and put it into um, spheres that people can study and that have that have the implementation of that knowledge um, work in a in a medical environment. So if someone is having a heart attack, then a healthcare professional or a doctor or whoever knows what to do. But at the same time, again, we have to factor in every subject is different. So even though their constituted parts may operate the same. The environmental conditions are always different. You know, the subject may be coming from, you know, one area of the country in a very specific type of um, uh, climate. And then you may have another subject coming from a totally different climate um, who's been experienced um, by different things. They may be a smoker, which is uh, affecting their body in a particular way. So there's no way, there's no way that any field of medical study could encapsulate the entire domain of possible experience. Again, this goes back to, you know, not being able to know 
everything, the foreclosure of, of, of the totality of experience. Um, you can't cover all of that in a book in four years of, of medical study, um, in seven years of a, 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 a residency or, or whatever. So when they're working on somebody or, or you know, these medical miracles happen, you know, it's not, it's not solely because they either just didn't know or didn't have, um, you know, all the resources or, or the subject was um, uh, just sort of, you know, magical or whatever. Uh, not magical, but, but, mm -hmm. you, but you get the sense of what I'm saying, like just a, mm -hmm. a, a miracle in itself. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of things that even within that sphere, they don't know. Anything could, could still happen. So not being able to take all of those factors into account um, I think it's important for the everyday subject to to really um, uh, to really I'll just use respect respect what it is that they do because mm -hmm. there's there's a lot that can go wrong and but there's a lot that that does go right given um, the 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 things that um, given the state of things that could happen at that particular time. So being in that environment, in the medical environment has, has upped my respect like a thousand fold. Um, so, so hopefully uh, I can make a, a, a longer, uh, a longer stay in the, in the medical field. So, so we'll see what the future holds. Yeah. Wishing you the best of luck. And thank you so much for this really refreshing conversation. I think Laura and I can both speak to just the, the, the amount of thought that you've, you know, yeah. you, you can tell that you're a thinker and, and it was just so refreshing to be able to just talk through some of these things, despite us maybe not coming to any specific answers, being able to really talk through them. And I had, I had a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean, it was, it's been a pleasure talking with you guys. Yeah. Maybe next time we can, you know, have more of like a, a, a coffee talking um, oh, let's do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because like I said, I'm definitely not an expert in anything. And I, I really resist, I resist trying to take that um, position because even with the amount of knowledge that anybody, you know, knows about anything, you know, I mean, we could have talked Lacan for the past hour, but even with that, you know, I can't do the work for you that person can't do the work for you mm -hmm. you know, you have to go out into the world and encounter you know the phenomena every day and figure out how you're going to navigate it so um when i think about you know theory and, and praxis you know that already for me is an artificial you know split it it doesn't exist for me so they're already one and the same and happening at the same time. So with that in mind, you have to, you have to do the work. You have to do the work. So part of that process is assessing your environment. So reading, undertaking a field of study, whatever the case may be, but you still have to go out into the clinical environment that is the world and living and B, you have to act, you have to perform, you have to perform it out and, um, and get that feedback. And then given the impasses or through ways that you may discover along the way, um, take those as lessons, reassess and do the process over again. Yeah. So part of life is an excessive amount of redundancy. And I think um, I'm certain that that is the cause of a lot of our anxiety, you know, day in and day out. So not just the redundancy of going to work, not the, just the redundancy of having to pay bills, um, but just what it means to be and exist without, without knowing, without having answers, concrete answers to the fundamental questions of life, having to construct your own having to play your own God at the same time that you are the subject, um, you know, working through the world. 
Um, it's it's a it's a terrible feeling. Not terrible as in bad, but terrible as in the weight of what that means. Um, and it's a uh, it's hard work. It's hard work, but um, you know we have to do it. Mm-hmm. So that's the essence of what I mean when I'm when I say, you know, I'm an interlocutor. Um, I'm in a very specific certain circumstance. You know, I have I have a lot of books, but I don't have the time to to read them. The reason I bought them in the first place was to have them on hand, mm-hmm. so I don't have to depend on the library, you know, and, and giving them back and trying to take it out and, and all that back and forth. So it's been incredibly useful for that. But again, um, I'm always I'm always moving and in, in, in transit, and you know, most of the day. I don't have them in front of me. So I'm forced to rely on my intuition. I'm forced to rely on my imagination, um, forced to rely on my immediate environment and circumstances to conjure up things that I may, you know, want to discuss. So if there was a message that I had to give to anybody, it's don't wait for um, legitimization. You know, don't wait for Plato to legitimize what it is that you want to say in philosophy if you feel like you have something to say. So put Plato to the side, let him sit in the corner. It doesn't matter that you haven't read, you know, all 2000 pages of of his works. It doesn't matter because number one, he comes from a certain time. And while there may be truths that resonate with, you know, our contemporary situation, it's not his responsibility to encapsulate that, but also he can't do that because he's not here anymore. You're the one living, not him. So um, that responsibility falls on you to uh, to make those adjustments and, and adaptations. And there's plenty, you know, there's plenty that you um, can say on your own, regardless of who you are. Doesn't matter the everyday subject, person down the street, um, all the way across the world. No, everyone. So everybody has something to say, but it's up to you to figure out how you're going to say it and and just put it out there. This episode of the Unconventional Diet podcast is sponsored by Anchor. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. First of all, Anchor is completely free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer, and Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. It's everything you need to make a podcast all in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. That's anchor.fm.